Friends, it is Easter morning. It certainly doesn't look the way that I expected. <laughs> it may not look the way that you expected, but it is Easter morning. Who could have imagined 40 days ago when we celebrated Ash Wednesday that this is what our Lenten journey would look like? Who could have imagined that Lent, our 40 days in the wilderness, would be quite so literal? I was planning to give up dairy for Lent. So I thought that my biggest struggle, my greatest absence during this holy season was going to be cheese. That's what I thought my struggle was going to be. Well, let me tell you, that went right on out the window as soon as isolation started. <laughs> because I had to give up some other things, right? I had to give up hugging my friends. We all had to give up hugging our friends. We had to give up dining out, walking along the lakefront, worshiping in our beautiful sanctuary. Oof, who could have imagined? I've been feeling very tender all week. My emotions very close to the surface. Each day of Holy Week, the scriptures have really touched me, have touched my heart. As we journeyed from the Last Supper to the crucifixion to Holy Saturday to finally Easter Sunday, this morning, I found that the texts have had a resonance for me deeper than any Easter that I can remember. I think that's because this year we're so close to the Easter story. I know, I know we can't celebrate the way we normally do. There was no pancake breakfast, no omelet egg station. There's no altar full of lilies. Yet, we are so close to the Easter story as it is told in the gospel. When I was a kid, the first thing I would do on Easter morning is I would rip open my bedroom door and I would just dive head first into my Easter basket. And I would sort of immediately begin gnawing on an Easter bunny, a chocolate bunny the size of my face. And then I'd sort of alternate between eating the chocolate bunny and eating those Reese's peanut butter cup eggs. Just kind of go back and forth, a bite of an ear, a bite of an egg, a bite of an ear, a bite of an egg. And that was breakfast, just chocolate, maybe a little bit of sugar before throwing on my Easter vest and jumping in the van to drive to Easter worship service. Easter was magnificent from the very moment I woke up. And that's what many of us are used to, right? knowing what's going to happen, having it just be this glorious day from the very minute we wake up. Yet if we look at the scripture, we see that the first Easter morning was not like that. It was not immediately triumphant, at least not that the disciples were aware. Remember at the start of the text, the followers of Jesus don't know what has happened. They're still waiting. They're still grieving. They're still sitting with anxiety, wondering what in the world the next day will bring. Does that sound familiar to anyone? We too are in a period of waiting, right? We too are increasingly in a period of grieving. And we too might this very morning be sitting with anxiety around what is going to happen next. So we are in good company. We are in holy company. For as the sun rose on that first Easter morning, the disciples did not yet know what was going to happen. They did not yet know about the empty tomb. On this morning, we're so close to that first Easter story because we know what it means to sit in the waiting and in the unknowing. We can really empathize with those disciples who were huddled in their homes. They too were sheltered in place. And so Mary Magdalene, she emerges out of that, out of the waiting. And Mary goes to the tomb before the sun is even risen. 
And she isn't expecting anything more than a body. Nothing more than a chance to anoint her dear teacher and friend. So imagine her shock, her utter shock at seeing the empty tomb. She came to grieve, to mourn, and yet someone has taken Jesus away. Imagine her confusion. Confusion that only grows once Peter and the other disciple get involved. And the scene, it becomes almost funny, right? We've got disciples doing foot races, running to and from the tomb. It would really be funny if we just weren't so intimately acquainted with what that confusion and that anxiety feels like. Mary, she runs to get Peter and the other disciple, and then all three of them run back to the tomb and then gain the courage to actually go in and see that, yes, indeed, Jesus isn't there. But we still haven't reached that moment of recognition, the moment of triumph. The disciples, they still don't know what all of this means. The text says in verse 9, they did not understand the scripture that Jesus must rise from the dead. Peter and the other disciple return home to continue waiting, to continue wondering, to continue praying. They see a glimmer of something holy, but they're not quite sure yet what it is. They don't yet understand. Mary, however, Mary does not return home. She stands bereft outside the empty tomb, tears falling down her face. She looks in again and she sees angels angels. And yet all that she can say in the presence of these angels is, I don't know where they have taken him. And then she turns and she sees another figure, a man who she assumes must be the gardener. And she falls on him crying and saying, please, please take me to where they have laid him. In the midst of her grief, in the midst of her unknowing, Mary is surrounded by the holy. She doesn't know it, but she is surrounded by the holy. She is in the presence of angels. She is standing before the risen Christ. But she doesn't recognize it until Jesus says her voice. Mary. Rabuni, teacher, she cries, she proclaims. And I imagine Mary just throwing her arms around Jesus and pulling him tight. I mean, in fact, she must do something like that because Jesus tells her, Mary, Mary, don't hold on to me. I must ascend to God. But you should go. Go and tell others what you have seen. And that's where it is. That's where the triumph, the magnificence is fully revealed in those early hours, hours that were filled with weeping and anxiety and confusion. Jesus shows up. Christ is risen. Jesus is in our midst this morning. Jesus continues to show up where there is anxiety and confusion. Dare I say, Jesus shows up in the middle of pandemic. Even if we don't recognize it, we are surrounded by the holy. And Jesus doesn't just show up. Jesus shows up and knows us. Just as he knows Mary, Jesus knows us and says our names. Curtis. Christina. Jane. Ted. Susan. Jesus says our names. I've been talking a lot with old friends during the midst of all of this. I know a lot of you have been doing the same. FaceTime dinners, long telephone calls, Zoom dance parties. And these calls, they have reminded me of the blessing of being known. The blessing of being seen for all that you are and being loved anyway or maybe being loved in spite of it. It's been a great relief to talk to people who know the particular look I get on my face when I'm not doing okay. 
people who can remind me of my own strengths, to be with people who know my name. I pray that all of you have the same. Jesus knows us like that. Jesus knows that look on our face. Jesus knows what we've been through. Jesus knows what we're going through. Even more than that, Jesus knows what we can't even speak out loud. Oh, and he loves us and he calls us by name in the midst that all that we are carrying right now, in the midst of everything that's weighing on us, Jesus calls our names. Jesus doesn't leave us alone. So like Mary this morning, our task is to recognize that voice, to recognize the risen Christ. And it might not happen immediately. I mean, it takes Mary a moment. After all, Jesus wasn't where she expected him to be, right? He was supposed to be in the tomb, but there he is, standing, looking like a gardener, alive and well. Where is Jesus for you this morning? We aren't meeting him the way we expected. Goodness knows we aren't meeting him in our church building this morning. But he is alive. Where is Jesus for you? Can you hear him say your name? Can you see him at work in the hands and feet and faces and actions and words of those around you? Jesus is risen. And Jesus is in the bodies of the doctors and nurses and pharmacists and care technicians and respiratory therapists and janitors who are keeping our hospitals open and running so that people can recover from COVID-19. Jesus is risen and Jesus is in the voice of the chaplain and the minister who comforts the bereaved. Jesus is risen and Jesus is in the feet of the grocery store clerk and the delivery person who are keeping so many of us fed and supplied. Jesus is risen and Jesus is in the face of teachers who continue to reach out to their students and encourage them to stay curious. Jesus is risen and Jesus is in those exhausted arms of the parent who is balancing work and care and playtime and mealtime. Jesus is risen and Jesus is in the hands of the CTA drivers and the electricians and all of the essential workers that are keeping our cities and towns running as best they can. Jesus is risen and Jesus is in the eyes of our children who look around and still see all the wonders of creation. Can you recognize him? Can you see him? He's saying your name. First John chapter five tells us that God is love. When we see love, we're seeing God. When we see love, we see Jesus. I have been so moved by the way that this church has continued to love each other in the midst of this. We can't get together in person, but we've been gathering like this via technology. Let me tell you, they don't teach you a class in seminary about how to do any of this, but we are gathering and we are loving despite the imperfection and Wi-Fi glitches and awkward pauses and a pastor who has prayed more than one time on mute. We have called one another and we have prayed together. And I have been so moved by the love I've seen in our city and around the world. The solidarity shown to people who are incarcerated, the acknowledgement that they are human beings worthy of dignity and the push for them to be compassionately released or have medical furlough, the pushback against the xenophobic actions against our Asian brothers and sisters and siblings, the recognition of the essential labor that so many do without adequate pay. The support for those who have lost jobs, the support for those who are just struggling to make it day to day, it is love. It's all love. That's what Holy Week is all about. It's about that love, the love of a Christ who washed the feet of his disciples. The love of a Christ who asked us to remember him. The love of a Christ who died for peace and justice and mercy for all people. The love of a Christ who rose again to show us that in the end, it's love. 
love over anything else, love that triumphs. It's such good news. So good that we can't hold it to ourselves. Like Mary, once we recognize that good news, once we recognize the risen Christ, we want to hold it for ourselves. We want to cling to it tightly. But we can't just hold him for ourselves, right? We can't hold him back from the world. We've got to share it. We've got to share that the risen Christ extends beyond any one of us individually. We have to share that nothing, nothing can hold him back. The tomb couldn't hold him. Mary couldn't hold him. Physical distancing can't hold him. Pandemic can't hold him. Nothing, nothing can hold Jesus. The risen Christ extends to all equally and fully. Jesus comes into our hearts, into the darkest corners where there's anxiety and grief and loneliness, and he speaks our names with love. Let us recognize it. Let us hear it. Let us proclaim it and let us share it. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Amen.